we would like to begin uh, in uh, one minute, please. But before we begin, uh, there's a message for uh, Mr. Richard Martin of the Bank of Montreal on the message board, which is an urgent uh, telephone message. Uh, uh, the board itself is just outside the, uh, the doors to this room. It's my uh, pleasure now to introduce um, Irene David of Ernst & Young. Uh, Irene is a partner with Ernst & Young in Toronto and directs their Toronto Commodity Tax Practice. Uh, she is a recent graduate of Queen's University, uh, worked for Revenue Canada Customs and Excise before joining Ernst & Young in 1980 and uh, has uh, built a substantial practice in this area and in the Toronto uh, uh, Toronto area and anyone who, uh, who works in this area will be well acquainted with um, Irene. Uh, she's given many presentations and speeches, uh, very active in the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants in organizing uh, seminars and, and educational materials, but also very active in, in, in client development. Uh, she is uh, currently a member of the Deputy Minister of National uh, Revenue uh, uh, Sales Tax Advisory uh, Committee and is the past chairman of the uh, Commodity Tax Committee of the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants. So we'd like to welcome Irene, who will speak to us today on systems issues under the Goods and Services Tax. Okay. Thanks, Rick. <coughs> As Tom uh, mentioned in his presentation before coffee, essentially GST is a consumption tax. It's designed to be paid by the ultimate consumer and with certain exceptions, businesses do not pay GST. They're charged it, and then they claim it back as a credit. So for accounting purposes, it's a balance sheet item only. It does not form part of your sales revenues numbers, nor does it form part of your cost of goods. It's uh, when goods are purchased or services are purchased, they're always costed net of the GST. The GST, when it comes in, is posted to a GL, GST receivable account because eventually you will get that tax back from the government, in most cases the end of the following month. So it's important to remember from both your own uh, point of view and that of your customers, your clients, that any GST charged to you is refundable and uh, if you, I hope this doesn't happen very often, but if your purchases are greater than your revenues, you will get a refund of the GST. Now, your clients as well, with certain exceptions, will also be entitled to an input tax credit or a refund of the GST. So it's really important, and, and we'll talk about client reactions to the tax, but there is sort of this, uh, well, it's an uninformed frenzy out there. People have a feeling that everything's going up by an extra 7% on Jan 1, and they don't stop to realize how the tax works, that it's replacing an existing tax as far as consumers are concerned. And from a business's point of view, in most cases, they will be entitled to an input tax credit. And we'll see that there's always an exception, as uh, Tom mentioned. Now, as far as systems changes are concerned, they really hinge on two major sets of rules. Those related to the timing of the GST liability and the timing of when you're entitled to the credit because your system has to be able to pick up when you can claim the credit and pick up when you um, are required to remit tax to the government. And secondly, and probably the more stringent, well, one of the more stringent sets of rules, what documentation do you require to claim back input tax credits and what documentation does your, do your clients require for them to claim back the input tax credits? So we'll take a look at some of these changes. But before we do, I'll just briefly run over timing of GST liability. Uh, Tom briefly mentioned it. That generally, the general rule is that tax is triggered when an invoice is issued. That's the general rule. And then there are a whole bunch of overriding rules and exceptions. Similarly, a credit is triggered based on the date of invoice. Date of payment is irrelevant in most cases. So if you invoice a client January 15th, 
that triggers the tax liability, and if you're a monthly filer, the tax must be remitted to the government at the end of the following month, so the end of February, in the case of a January 15th bill, regardless of whether or not your client has paid you. Similarly, if you receive an invoice dated January 15th, you claim a credit at the end of February, regardless of whether you have paid for that invoice. So really, from a, a most people are referring to this tax for most businesses as a cash flow tax. It is not a cost to business, but there is a, a built-in cost of financing that cash, particularly for law firms who are always crying the blues that their receivables are four months or five months on average. And um, now there's going to be an extra 7% financing cost of that 7% to carrying those receivables. And we'll look at that. The other important thing on the GST uh, timing rules is that there is no matching concept under GST. If you, and there's no depreciation or amortization. If you go out and purchase a, a new computer for $50,000, <laughs> you'll be charged the 7% on that $50,000. You get the tax back the next month. You don't have to amortize it as you do for um, income tax. There's no CCA rules. Now, there are exceptions to the general timing rule, and um, one in particular that Tom mentioned uh, deals with deposits, that deposits are only taxable or trigger the tax when they're applied as consideration or when they are forfeited. And there is certainly some debate as to what is a deposit, but as soon as you have an exception to the general rule, then your system has to be able to deal with that exception so that when you uh, issue an invoice to a client with respect to a deposit, you have to make sure that your system can deal with the different tax treatment of that particular type of invoice. Now, the second set of, rule that, uh, set of rules that systems changes hinge on relates to documentation. And unfortunately, the government has not um, made a decision yet as to what documentation requirements must be met. They have said that essentially any invoice for goods or services, regardless of who to whom that invoice is issued, be it a consumer or a business, must indicate the consideration and whether tax is payable or the amount of tax payable or whether tax is included. And this is one of the, the complaints about the proposed GST system, is that businesses have a choice. They can sell plus GST or GST included. So you could get an invoice um, at the uh, retail store for $100 plus 7, or you could go to another retail store and get an invoice for 107 If a business sells for 107 there must be a statement that this price includes GST. Similarly, uh, businesses selling to another business have a choice, tax extra or tax included. Now, the problem that businesses experience is that all businesses who purchase goods and services are going to want to claim input tax credits. So the government has indicated that the documentation requirements will be much more stringent for purposes of claiming back the tax. They want to make sure that you can justify that you were charged the tax and they don't want to give back any more tax than was charged. So the Department of Finance about a year and a half ago issued some guidelines as to what documentation requirements they wanted met to substantiate input tax credit claims. Now these requirements, I mean the documentation and the backup, will not be required at the time the return is filed, but they have to be available for audit um, on a periodic basis. And what the Department of Finance said was that as the value of the supply becomes greater, the documentation requirements become more stringent. So they established three sets of uh, requirements, one for invoices or supplies valued at less than 30, one set of rules for between 30 and 150, and another set of rules for over 150. But these, as I mentioned, they're not law yet. Um, Revenue Canada has the authority to prescribe the documentation requirements by regulation. The uh, requirements that finance issued are guidelines merely uh, at this point. Revenue is looking at this whole area now and they're having all kinds of problems and I'll deal with them as we go through my session. But they're trying to base 
their requirements on finance's technical paper, and that seems to be where they're running into the problems. <coughs> From a systems point of view, okay, the under $30 purchases, the government has indicated or finance has indicated that they'll allow people to claim back the tax as long as the invoice has the vendor's name, a date, and the total consideration. So they're really not requiring that much information. Once you get to purchases above $30, then you need the vendor's name, the, the GST date, the total consideration, and the vendor's registration number. So for you as a business to claim back tax in respect of any purchases of goods and services, you must ensure that your suppliers have put on that invoice their vendor registration number. And it must also indicate the amount of GST charged or that GST was included. Similarly, your customers are going to want that information from you. They are going to want you on your invoices to indicate your GST registration number, which will be a nine-digit number, and either GST <coughs> extra or GST included. For purchases in excess of $150 of goods and services, it's, all, it's the same information, except they want a description of the supply. And initially, the government had indicated that they wanted the terms of sale indicated on the invoice, whether it was cash, 2% uh, net 30. Uh, I think that they're relaxing on that, and that, that probably will not be a requirement. Again, though, these are right now just draft, and um, Revenue is working on a paper with respect to input tax credit documentation that is about 40 pages long so far. And we'll talk about some of the issues as we go through. The crux of the matter, though, is, is you have to have sufficient documentation to substantiate your input tax credit. Now, they have indicated that no supporting documentation will be required with respect to certain items. And uh, one I'm sure is a big expense, coin-operated machines. Uh, you don't have to get a receipt when claiming the tax back on those. And then secondly, on certain reimbursements. And we'll talk about those when we get to meals and entertainment and, and, and passenger vehicle rules. But essentially, reasonable per diems that are paid to employees for meals, mileage, you don't have to have receipts from the employee. You can claim back seven over 107 of those reimbursements, providing they're reasonable and they're not taxable benefits under the Income Tax Act. So that's one area where documentation is not required. And other cases prescribed by regulation which have not yet been prescribed. There's something like 58 regulations that have to be prescribed in forms, and um, very few have been prescribed yet. So while all systems will be affected under GST, um, the two that I'm going to concentrate on are the revenue systems and the purchases systems. Now first of all, in a law firm, the types of systems that they have are all over the map. Some are on a, a manual system, others have a, a fairly sophisticated computerized system. I think the first thing a, a firm has to do is just sit back and take a look at their system and scope it out, see whether their system is even capable, if they're computerized, of adding 7%. A lot of them are not. Um, they don't have enough fields, they just don't, they're very antiquated systems, they can't even add the 7%. Well, if you can't do that, you're certainly not going to be able to differentiate between zero rated and taxable supplies. Those of people who have manual, as one of my clients said, he always knew a manual system would come in handy, that um, now it's, it's relatively simple, you just have to add on the 7%. Mind you, you're going to have all the lawyers in the firm doing that, but um, we'll talk about that later. So then, another decision that has to be made is, will we be selling tax extra or tax included? And I think the general consensus is, businesses will be selling tax extra when selling to other businesses. You as a business will want your suppliers to sell to you tax extra because it makes it much simpler to track the tax, just pick it up off the invoice. Your customers, your clients, in turn, will want you to sell tax extra. It also makes it easier from a pricing point of view. It doesn't look like your fees are as high. Second uh, consideration that has to be made 
is what are you going to do about the GST registration number? You will have to have on your invoices or your statements your GST registration number once you apply for it. Now Blake has a copy here. He is one of the <coughs> I think 800, well more than 800,000, 1. 8 million uh, taxpayers who still have not sent in their uh, registration certificate, which he doesn't need, so he still has to send it in because they're computer coded. Um, once you send those forms in, the partnership, you will get a registration number. Now are you going to have that manually typed on each invoice that's cut to your clients? Or are you going to redesign your statements so that the number is pre-printed on that um, statement? Now, most firms don't have, well, a lot of firms don't have special invoices or special bills. They sometimes just do it on plain letterhead. Somehow you're going to have to get that number incorporated into your billing procedures. Now, as far as calculating the tax is concerned, again, 7%. Um, it's not the easiest number to multiply by, but I don't think it'll be seven for very long. So, um, <laughs> nice 10 sounds like a nice easy number. So GST extra, it's very simple to add the seven onto your invoices. If you choose, for some reason, to sell tax included, then the tax is going to be seven one oh sevenths of the amount invoiced. So you would have to raise your fees by a certain percent and then extract 7107 and that's the amount that would have to be remitted to the government. I can't see very many law firms selling tax included. Another thing that your system should take into consideration are any adjustments to sale price. And Tom mentioned this, bad debt write-offs. You have to make sure that once you write off a bad debt, you claim back the tax from the government. Um, similarly, if you give a, a client a credit note or a, or a discount, that's a similar treatment to bad debts. When you give them the discount, you can claim back the tax, or when you give them a credit note, there are special rules for that. So make sure that you do take all your adjustments. And on the return form, there is a separate line for adjustments to sale price to um, remind taxpayers to claim back their credits. Now, on the revenue side as well, there are special rules with respect to what they call deemed supplies. It's a general rule GST is collectible, and, and you'll be an agent collecting the government, collecting the tax on behalf of the Crown. But there are also some supplies that most people do not consider to be part of their revenues, and these are the so called deemed supplies. For example, employee benefits. Now, Law firms, I think, are like accounting firms. There aren't a lot of employee benefits um, in terms. The first, the biggest one would be a car, and I don't think a lot of uh, firms give their employees cars um, or other items of a taxable nature. I mean, most employee benefits in, in a law firm would be things like uh, medical, insurance, that sort of thing, which are not taxable, and so there are no GST implications. But you should look at your um, employee benefits to see if there are any, any items that could possibly trigger GST. And that would include cars. If you gave your employee a computer, a car phone, um, more tangible items that are taxable employee benefits for income tax purposes, uh, there are GST implications. So the T4 system has to be tied into the um, uh, revenue system. We'll talk about cars. Um, a little later. Now the timing controls, obviously, they pay, place, um, play a key factor in any system, that your system has to be able to pick up the date of invoice, um, and then also differentiate between deposits and non-deposits, so that you don't pay your GST too early. One of the biggest complications, I think, for a law firm relates to the transactions where there are agent, or identifying those transactions where there are agent, uh, agency relationships versus principal relationships. And I know from talking to some law firms that is going to be the biggest headache. Um, the general rule is, is that if you incur, if you as a lawyer incur a transaction or incur an expense as agent, for your client, 
then providing you invoice the client for that particular disbursement separately, the disbursement retains its original status. So for example, if you incurred uh, land transportation tax, you paid them on behalf of your client, um, and then you invoice them separately, the government, the provincial government, will not charge tax on land transportation charges uh, because they are exempt. Then, when you invoice your client, providing its invoice separately, you would not have to charge the, the client any tax on the tax. Alternatively, if you incurred uh, certain expenses as principal, then those expenses, whether or not they're invoiced separately, are considered to form part of your fees. Now, one example would be, let's say you went to Hong Kong on behalf of your client, you incurred airfare to Hong Kong, which is zero rated under the legislation, there's no GST, you incurred expenses while you were in Hong Kong, hotel accommodation, and then you came back and you invoiced your client. Those fees are all taxable now because you did not incur them as um, agent. I mean, it's just like income taxes. You can't split out your income taxes and say, well, these are exempt, therefore I'm going to split these out and I don't have to charge you tax on them. Anything you incur as principal then gets rolled into your fee, the tax status of your fee, and you have to charge tax. Now, for most clients, it doesn't matter, as Tom mentioned, because the majority of businesses, any GST you charge them, they get it back. The only people it really matters to are those who are not entitled to full input tax credits. For example, the financial community, banks, insurance companies, investment dealers, um, the mush sector, and we'll look at how each of these are affected. But for most businesses, it doesn't really matter. Banks and insurance companies, they are probably, the, you know, have done a lot of work in this area. And the Hong Kong example, they would likely um, take certain steps ahead of time to make sure that those payments did not become taxable. For example, they may pay your expenses um, and that way that they, those fees would remain zero rated. So it really depends on the status of the customer. But having said that, your system has to be able to identify which disbursements you incur as agent and which you dis incur as principal so that you charge tax appropriately. So they all have to be coded. Your system will also have to deal with certain customer requests. And uh, these will depend on who your clients are. Those of you who have a lot of clients in the financial sector will probably have more specialized requests than uh, lawyers who deal with the general population. For example, if I was an insurance company, I get taxed back in respect of certain activities that I perform. Uh, one example would be if I provide insurance to uh, where the risk is outside of the country, that's considered zero rated. Um, I'm exporting that financial service of insurance. It's zero rated, so any inputs that I acquire which relate to that exported service, I'm entitled to recapture the uh, GST that's charged to me. Alternatively, if I incur any expenses related to my domestic insurance, I'm not entitled to claim back the GST. So I have to have a sophisticated system to be able to track my inputs and allocate them. Well, one thing I might do is if I hired a lawyer to uh, draft an agreement exclusively relating to um, a zero-rated financial service, I might want the lawyer to put on the invoice a bit more more details than they currently put on their invoices so that I can track that specifically and I identify it, that it relates exclusively to my exported services. Then I get all the tax back. Otherwise, I may have to do an allocation. Again, yeah, those requests will be rare. I think they'll be more common at the beginning and uh, then see what happens. Now, from an audit trail point of view on the revenue side, Again, we're not sure what the, um, the government will require. They still have four and a half years to figure out what they need to know since there's a four-year audit period. And um, you, unfortunately, have to have all the documentation and the audit trail in well, just a little over six months ready to go. 
Normally, um, a normal invoice or sales journal uh, with the GST indicated a separate line item would probably be sufficient. You know, you'd have your sales journal, your revenue, uh, revenues for that period plus the seven percent. They normally would just look to that, spot check some invoices. What they're really going to look at, though, are those invoices in respect to which you didn't collect any GST, not the ones that you did collect. So you'll have to make sure that uh, you can tie it into specific invoices where um, no tax was charged. Okay, so now we'll just take a look at the purchases side quickly. You as a purchaser are entitled to claim back all the tax, um, pretty well all the tax, there are some exceptions which we'll look at, um, in respect of your purchases of goods and services. You, however, have to meet the same documentation requirements or you need your suppliers to meet the same documentation requirements as you're required to meet on your revenue side. So you're going to want all your suppliers to indicate on their invoice their vendor registration number. Now what some companies are doing is that those who have vendor <coughs> files from their major suppliers, they are incorporating that GST registration number into the vendor master file. And then they know that the vendor has met the documentation requirements necessary to claim back the tax and they don't have to check each and every invoice. They just check them once. And unless the vendor changes their invoicing procedures, they just indicate in the vendor master file that the documentation is okay, this is their number, and then they can claim the tax back in the future. No matter what you do, though, the coding for the accounts <coughs> payable person has doubled. Um, every single invoice that comes in has to be split some way because now you'll be posting, um, if you're purchasing we we'll use accounting services. If you're buying accounting services for $500 now, once January 1 comes around, those services will be 500 plus 35. That invoice has to be split. You post the $500 to one account, and then the $35 gets posted to a GST receivable account. So it's just, it's not that much more complicated, it's just more time consuming. One thing to watch on the payable side is that the payable person picks up the right <coughs> number. Some things you'll be buying, will, you'll be charged GST and PST, stationary uh, forms, that sort of thing. So the GST comes, bef well, in Ontario, the GST comes before the PST in most provinces. You have to make sure that they just pick up the GST number and not the PST number. If you're in BC and Manitoba, the only difference is that the GST is not, or the PST is not compounded onto the GST. Still, GST always comes before PST. If any of your suppliers t charge uh, GST included, that complicates life for your payable uh, person because then they have to look at the invoice and go, okay, does this include GST? And what if it's interest? Interest is exempt. There is no GST credit in respect of interest. And the danger is that if you accept invoices from vendors who sell tax included, then the payables clerk may always take 7107s on all invoices where the GST isn't shown separately and you will have a liability because you'll have claimed too much tax back. You should insist, as most major businesses are insisting, that all suppliers sell to you tax extra and uh, many companies have sent letters out to their suppliers indicating that if they do not sell taxes extra, their invoices will not be paid until they redo their invoices. <coughs> as far as allocating input tax credits, to a large extent law firms will not have to be involved in this. I mean, un unless someone is very heavily involved in director's fees, which are exempt, um, I think most law firms could argue that all their inputs relate exclusively to carrying on a commercial activity, either taxable or zero rated supply. And exclusively for purposes of GST will be um, interpreted as 90% or more. So I don't think there are many law firms which will have to look at their inputs and say, okay, these relate to an exempt activity, I can't claim it back. That's what the 
um, banks and insurance companies will have to do. So allocation should not be a major um, task for law firms. Now one thing we've suggested to a number of clients on the purchases side is that they have some kind of exception report built into their system which they can have spit out every few months um, a listing of all purchases where an input tax credit was not claimed as just a check to make sure that you're maximizing your GST refunds because that's what they are. Also you might want to have an input tax credit for all purchases in excess of a certain dollar value with respect to which you did claim a credit just to spot check and make sure that those purchases <coughs> met the documentation requirements. So, you know, over $50,000 purchases or something like that just to make sure you're not incurring a big liability. <coughs> now with any taxing rule, of course there are all kinds of exceptions. We said that uh, you will be entitled, because you're carrying on a commercial activity, you're entitled to claim back all the tax you were charged. Well, you won't be charged tax on certain items, and Tom already mentioned those, salaries, wages, uh, interest, dividends, zero-rated purchases, if you bought basic groceries, for example, for your uh, uh, coffee room, you won't be charged uh, tax on that, certain exempt purchases, certain federal, provincial, municipal taxes. There will be also items in respect of which you will be charged the GST, however there will be some overriding or there are some overriding rules which will either limit the amount you can claim back or deny any credit altogether. And the one that everyone's been uh, toying with is the one related to meals and entertainment expenses. It's always the smallest dollar item that creates the most amount of paperwork. Essentially, these restrictions, as a general rule, are paralleling those contained in the Income Tax Act. So what the government has done is in the GST legislation for meals and entertainment expenses, you can only claim back 80% of the GST charged, similar to the rules under the ITA. So if you have an employee or, a, or if a lawyer in your firm goes out, entertains a client, uh, puts in an expense report for $300 and indicates on the expense report that the GST charged was $17, you can claim back 80% of the $17. Now, for administrative ease, the government has said that on a monthly basis or an ongoing basis, you can claim back 100% of the GST and then at the end of the year when you do your income tax adjustment you can recapture the 20 percent and pay back the 20 percent of the GST. Now they were under the impression you could use the same records as for income tax but unfortunately you will not be able to because your income tax records include both domestic and non-domestic meals and entertainment expenses and you don't have to pay back any tax on your non-domestic because you didn't claim any credits because you weren't charged tax on meals and expenses incurred in the United States. So it's going to be a bit of a problem segregating those expenses in respect to which you have to pay back the 20 percent. The other problem with meals and entertainment is that I, excuse me, I have yet seen an expense report where you can split out the tax. <coughs> because if you take a, a meal in Ontario, that meal, the, the price of the meal, then there's GST, then there's PST, and then there's the tip. And an individual submitting an expense report usually just submits one line item. You're lucky if you get a receipt, but it's usually one number on the invoice. If you take 7 107ths of the amount claimed, you are overclaiming your input tax credits. It should be something less than that. So what industry has recommended to the government is that instead of companies having to um, develop spreadsheets for expense reports that there should be a, some kind of factor that they can apply to their meals and entertainment expenses and other expenses on expense reports that imputed with an imputed PST or tip factor and the government is looking at that now so for example instead of applying 7107 you might apply 5105 and that would take into account the 20 percent um, denial as well as the fact that the amount claimed in an expense report it includes GST, includes the PST and the tip. 
which is denied. So that's something the government is looking at right now. Some companies, some businesses have said it's something, you know, it's too costly to administer and that they may let Revenue Canada assess them for the tax when they're audited. Okay, another potential problem on the input tax credit side relates to passenger vehicles. And it's actually not a problem, it's, it's fairly straightforward. The government has said that businesses will be entitled to claim back the GST on, uh, in respect of passenger vehicles used in a commercial activity. However, the amount claimed back is capped at 7% of 24000 It's parallel in the income tax rules. So if you go out and buy a car for $100,000, you will get a maximum <coughs> input tax credit of 7% of 24000 Similarly, there's a similar rule on the lease payments. The GST credit is capped at 7% of six fifty a month. However, once again, for administrative ease, if you have a lease um, of $1,000 a month, you can claim 7% on the full 1000 and then at the end of the year do a recapture back to the 650 Now another restricted input tax credit, well actually a complete denial, relates to club dues. Any membership fees, initiation fees or dues in a dining, recreational or sporting club, no one can claim the tax back in respect of those fees. Expenses incurred at the clubs are subject to the normal rules, you know, the meals, the 80% rule, um, entertainment, the 80% rule, but the actual fees, no input tax credits can be claimed. Now, <clears throat> travel and other allowances I mentioned earlier, <coughs> to the extent they're deductible under the Income Tax Act um, and you give an employee uh, travel or um, meal allowance, you can claim back 7107. It's assumed that those allowances include GST because the employee would normally go out, spend the money, the employee would be charged the tax. If the company had made those expenses themselves or the firm had made those expenses themselves, they would have been entitled to a credit. So the government's giving the 7107s back. There are still some problems, though, even with those allowances in that sometimes they don't split domestic and foreign travel and then the meals and entertainment. Now on the purchases side, the system also has to be capable, in addition to addressing these restricted and uh, denied input tax credits, your purchase system must also be capable of dealing with non-invoiced expenses. Uh, there are many items that you will purchase where no invoice is issued. So you can't have a system geared entirely to date of invoice to determine your credits. Examples would include uh, leases, commercial leases. Frequently there are no invoices issued or cut in respect of commercial leases, but the landlord will want an extra 7% on effective January 1st, 1991. They will have to uh, put an addendum to the lease agreement in terms of claiming back the tax on those lease payments, the legislation says you go back to the agreement and you're entitled to claim a credit when the agreement says that the payment falls due. So if the payment, if your lease payment falls due at the end of the month, say January 31st, you can claim back the credit at the end of February. Alternatively, if your lease payment falls due on the 1st of February, you can't claim that credit until the end of March. So one day can make quite a difference. Your landlord is going to want your payments to come due on the first of the month because they get that extra float till the end of the following month before they have to remit it. You on the other hand would like to pay it a day earlier and you get the tax back 30 days later if you're a monthly filer. Some of you will be quarterly but a lot of you will be monthly. So that's something to look at. But the bottom line is your system has to be able to pick up the GST that is paid on those and other any other non-invoice supplies, which you're going to have to look to see what you have. Now, imported services, another issue um, 
anyone who's engaged in a commercial activity, there's no GST implications with respect to imported services because if you have to pay on imported services, you'd be entitled to an immediate tax credit, so there's no incentive to acquire services offshore. If, however, you were involved in exempt activities, like a bank, an insurance company, there would be an incentive because you don't get the tax back. To make sure that that incentive is not there, the government has put in a self-assessment rule whereby if anyone who's exempt or not carrying on commercial activity imports a service, they must self-assess 7% GST on that imported service. Okay. The other, um, one other thing on the purchase side is, again, uh, agent principal transactions. You have to make sure that if you incur a transaction as an agent, then since you're not going to be charging your client any GST, you should not be claiming back any GST on the disbursement. If, for example, it was a taxable disbursement. Uh, you just pass on the full amount of the disbursement, including the GST, to your client, and then your client claims the tax back. You just paid it on their behalf. So you want to make sure you're not over-claiming your ITCs. Okay, so those are some of the issues, and you can read through my paper on the, the revenues and purchases side. Now I just want to spend a few moments on a few other issues that um, law firms will be involved in or should consider. Now the first one, management companies, Tom already addressed. There's really no cost here. If you have a management company, the management company will buy everything, get charged GST. The management company will charge the law firm GST. It's still left in the same um, position it was before. It claims the tax it was charged back as a credit, collects the additional tax from the law firm. The law firm claims it as a credit. It's just an in and out, in and out cash flow. That's all it is. Partner expenses. Uh, Tom, I believe, mentioned this, that in professional firms it's quite common for the individual partners to incur certain business expenses which they claim on their income tax returns. To the extent that those expenses incur GST, the partners can claim back the tax. So you will, you'll have to make sure that your partners are familiar with those rules and uh, know how to claim back the tax. Just while we're on your partners, that's the other um, problem in professional firms is that as a general rule, professional firms do not have a central billing department where everything is invoiced, taxes calculated. You have to educate all your billers on how to invoice the tax, when not to charge tax to um, non-residents, how to invoice disbursements, which ones are subject to the tax, which ones aren't. Aside, and how to claim. This is, they'll probably be more interested in how to claim back the GST on their tax return. Now, another issue for law firms is um, renegotiating um, prices for purchases that currently include federal sales tax. You right now make a number of purchases, like stationery, that's probably the biggest one, forms, where FST, 13.5% FST is buried in your purchase price. Once GST replaces FST, you should be expecting a drop in the price of those items and then the 7% is added on. So the prices go down, then the 7% is added on, and then you get a refund of that 7%. So your overall cost for these overhead items should be lower in 1991 than currently because you currently don't get any tax back. The biggest savings is telecommunications. Right now, you are charged 11% on telecommunication charges, fax, most uh, telephone charges. That 11% is non-refundable to you. It just forms part of your cost. Effective GN 1, 1991, the 11 will disappear. It will be replaced by the 7, and you get the 7 back as a credit or a refund. Your cost has just dropped by 11% for those expenses. So that's a large savings that you should be considering. And when, which brings us to setting 1991 fees, some of your more astute clients may say, well, geez, you're going to add this 7% on to your fees. I know that doesn't represent a cost to me, 
but you're going to experience some savings on some of your overhead items, so I don't think you should raise your fees by as much as uh, your hourly rates by as much as you were planning to. And they may question some of your fee adjustments. Um, as I mentioned, I already mentioned the education process, that you're going to have to educate all the lawyers in your firm to be able to deal with their customers, their clients. Um, books and records, I'll let you read through at your leisure. You have to keep them for six years. Now, just a couple of minutes on cost of compliance. Um, the government doesn't have too much sympathy for... Uh, law firms, unfortunately, or accounting firms. They have, there are some provisional, there have been some provisions made to ease the transitional cost. There is a uh, $1,000 maximum one-time transitional credit for small business. Um, it sort of starts at $300 and then works up to 1000 and caps out at uh, a business that has any annual revenues of $2 million. Anyone with revenues of in excess of $2 million doesn't get any of the credit. It's just a one-time credit. It's not going to go very far anyways. But they did introduce some quick method uh, rules of accounting to ease the, trans ease the administrative compliance costs for businesses and um, law firms and accounting firms are not allowed to use them regardless of the revenues. So we're stuck in the normal rules. There are no simplified measures for us. Okay, so now let's just take a few minutes and look at cash flow. We just, just wanted to mention cash flow that really it's just another reason you should get your invoices out faster and get paid faster because you're going to now be financing an extra 7%. And it's another reason why you should pay your payables even later, because uh, you'll get your credit even though you haven't paid the invoice. So that's how much like cash flow, but we'll look at a few examples in a few moments. Now, just, just wrap up in about five minutes. Client reactions to GST are going to be mixed. You are going to have everything ranging from a client, a business who is entitled to a full refund of the 7% saying, I'm not going to pay the 7% because they don't understand that they get the tax back, so you have to be prepared for that. You're going to get consumers who do not get the tax back, so anyone in real estate, um, a lot of those fees, it's now going to cost, even though used housing, for example, is not taxable, it's going to cost a consumer a lot more to move. They're going to get charged GST on the moving charges, on staying in a hotel, eating out in restaurants, uh, their lawyer's fees. It's just going to be a much more costly exercise. So you may have some price resistance there. On page 29 of my paper, you might want to flip, I just got a little chart that summarizes a few um, who gets what. And essentially, if you, in, if you deal with exclusively with businesses who are exclusively engaged in commercial activities, then any GST you charge them does not cost them a cent, especially based on their payment terms. You could also point out that they're coming out ahead because they'll be claiming back that 7% before they have to pay you the 7%. Provincial governments, they will either get a full rebate or they will not pay at source. Those rules are still being uh, ironed out. Some people will only be entitled to partial input tax credit depending on the extent of commercial activities they carry out. And those are summarized there. The FIs, the MUSH nonprofit sector, and then legal aid is going to get a full rebate actually now. That should be moved up. And then there are clients who will get no input tax credits. 7% represents an absolute cost to them, and that's the federal government and the consumers. Now, if you just flip to page 30, Exhibit 6, this just illustrates what happens, what the cost of the same service would be to varying types of customers. Um, we have here a, a lawyer's fee of 1000 plus 70 so that's what the invoice says. If the client is a bank engaged exclusively in financial services, then the bank would not get any input tax credit or rebate, so the cost of the bank for your services is now $1,070. dollars 
Alternatively, if it was a university, the university, we've assumed there's, there are going to be special rebates for the mush sector. They may get a 65% rebate of the GST. Regardless, their cost has gone up to 1,025 because they're only going to get the 65. Charity will get a 50% rebate. Municipality, we've used 55. They're going to get somewhere between 55 and 58. Hospital, they're likely going to get an 80% rebate of the GST. And then if you sell to an accounting firm, they get it all back. You say the accountants and lawyers always look after themselves. And um, so you can see that as a vendor, it doesn't matter who you're selling to, your service, you invoice in the same manner. Your invoice is still 1070 And then it's up to your individual clients to figure out their tax status. But to price and to know the reaction or to anticipate the reaction of your clients, you should have an understanding of how they're affected. So this just gives you an idea. Two um, myths are, that I just wanted to deal with. Again, there has been this um, misconception by many people that everyone's going to move their services in-house. They're not going to buy anything from external suppliers because they're going to get charged to 7%. They're going to move everything in-house. Well, that for 99% of the businesses, that is false. Because as you know, if you get charged tax, you get it back. So there is no incentive to moving it in-house other than cash flow. Where that falls apart, though, is if you are an exempt um, organization like a bank, insurance company, investment dealer, you are better off moving certain services in-house. And uh, it's not a big savings, but there are examples in my paper which I'll let you flip through at your leisure. But there's another fallacy that everyone's going to use non-resident lawyers because non-resident lawyers won't charge us tax. Uh, lawyers domiciled in Canada will charge us tax. That is out and outright wrong because if you are engaged in a taxable activity, your client is engaged in a taxable activity, they get all the tax back. If they're a bank or an insurance company and they use the services of a non-resident, they have to self-assess the 7%. So there is no incentive whatsoever. And my recommendation is just read through this so you're ready when your clients tell you that they want a 7% <coughs> reduction in their fee because they now have to pay this extra 7% tax. So that's really all I wanted to highlight, so I've gone over my time, and just say that in summary there are a lot of issues facing law firms. Um, I think the, the most difficult one to get a handle on is the agent principal uh, area. There are only six months left to have this up and running. Most businesses um, are trying to have parallel systems up and running before January 1, 1991. And, um, ideally November 1. What some clients are doing is they're looking at a month or two months of typical transactions, both on the purchase side and the sales side, and just tracking it through and seeing, okay, what would happen with respect to this transaction, and just very methodically going through everything. What you should be doing um, in the interim, if you haven't already, some of you probably already have your systems in place. If you haven't, you should be monitoring what happens on documentation requirements because those rules should come out within the next month to six weeks. So that's it as far as systems. Uh, the cases that Tom has put together really illustrate some of these issues and some of the complications and I guess we'll go over them now. Fine. I, one, one thing I'd like to say is uh, we will do the case studies now. <laughs> and uh, before we do that, uh, just to say that we will be taking questions. And if you do have questions, please write them out on a piece of paper. And uh, Brenda Duncan and Stephen Galbraith will circulate through the, um, through the audience and collect those questions uh, and uh, hand them to the front. And we'll deal with them at the end of the case studies. Please go ahead with the case studies. <clears throat> Um, in your materials, and they're in the Appendix A, are some case studies um, which I've put together, and um, they should illustrate some of these rules, and perhaps we'll just work through them. The, um, I should say I haven't had the benefit of input from Blake or Irene, so it'd be nice to see how I do on my own case studies. Um, the first example that I put together um, 
And uh, I will also say as another caveat, some of these are secondhand because I don't practice in these particular areas, but I do try to get some sort of feel of the kinds of things that come up. Uh, for example, in a personal injury action, and that's the first state case study. And you'll see the facts uh, are set out pretty straightforwardly on the first page. Just highlight them quickly. Your firm is acting for a plaintiff in a personal injury action. Claim involves an allegation of negligence uh, in respect of a microwave oven. Oh, is that the... Okay, again, you see I'm right in step with the materials. Apparently that's the second one in your uh, materials at the back. So any of you are having difficulty? Okay. In order, the first one's the real estate transaction, the second one's personal injury action. Since I've already started the personal injury action, let's stay with it, even though it's the second one there for any of those of you who are having trouble finding it. So the client was exposed to high levels of radiation, alleges that it is due to the microwave uh, oven being defective, and at issue, in addition to fault, is a quantum of damages. Now the action proceeds all the way to trial, at which time after hearing the evidence of the experts, the defendant proposes a structured settlement, which your client decides to accept. And a sample bill of costs is the second page. And then the third page are, are the disbursements. And then the fourth and fifth pages are the answers and hopefully they're all the right answers, although some of this could uh, be uh, up for discussion. Now you'll see on the bill of costs, there's uh, several items. Uh, the good doctor feel good and green glow to prepare um, in preparation statements of claim meetings with uh, medical experts. And the various uh, aspects of the legal fees are itemized including affidavit of documents, examination for discoveries, both of the plaintiff and the defendant, uh, preparing pretrial memo, and attending pretrial conference. These are pretty reasonable looking fees. Trial preparation and the trial, various letters and miscellaneous other. Then on the next page are disbursements. You'll see typical things like discovery transcripts, photocopy charges, expert medical reports. And uh, then there's an, also an expert report on radiation leakage and uh, then fees by the experts to attend the trial. Now, looking through the case study, answers, dealing with them in order. Number one, legal fees, they're clearly considered to be taxable and as such the law firm is required to collect GST from the client on the total fee for legal services of $7,700. And that was just the total for of all the things on the first page. Um, for, uh, sorry, on the page in the bill of costs, which was the second page. Now disbursements, court filing fees. Um, as you can see, that was exempt because that's in the list of um, exempt services, which I referred to in my paper. Filing or procuring of a document in a court is classified as an exempt supply pursuant to part six of schedule five. So no GST is payable on the fee. And uh, as Irene and I were saying, to avoid turning an exempt supply into a taxable supply, the law firm should incur that fee as an agent for the client. So uh, technical notes suggest that if you pay it in the name of the client, even though it may be on your check, you refer to the client in making that payment, then um, it, I presume that the um, Revenue Canada Administrating this, administering this tax will accept that as being on behalf of the client. Discovery transcripts, they will be taxable. The law firm will be charged GST. The, the, the court reporter that attended or the reporting company will charge GST on uh, the, the, the fee for attending and preparing the discovery transcripts. Photocopies, that's also a taxable supply. So the law firm is required to collect GST on that charge. Now expert reports is where the discussion gets a little interesting. Non-medical export re expert reports are clearly taxable and subject to GST. Now the exception is 
If the so-called expert is a small supplier, that means his total revenues in a year are less than $30,000. Um, if he is in that category, one might question how expert he is. He's obviously not in big demand. But there will be occasion when you run into situations where someone will have taxable services in, in less than $30,000. Now, as the note says, if the expert is under the $30,000 threshold, then that is an example where you'll want to incur that fee on behalf of the client as an agent in order not to, uh, to subject an exempt supply into a taxable supply when it goes through your uh, billing. Now, medical reports. There medical reports provided to an individual are tax exempt and the, the schedule that sets out medical services that are exempt uh, and the footnote notes particularly section 5 supply made by a medical practitioner of a, cons of a consultative diagnostic well, there's a comma in here it looks like it's misplaced comma treatment or other health care service rendered to an individual Okay, so if it's rendered to an individual and it's um, in the nature of a consultation, uh, diagnostic, treatment, or other health care service, then it's exempt. However, if it's rendered to the lawyer, then it would appear to be clearly taxable. So again, it's a situation, uh, and again, study to the small supplier caveat um, for the medical doctor. So uh, if he's not a small supplier and he renders it to the lawyer, it's taxable. If he renders it to the client, then it appears to be exempt. And uh, so again, you might want to try to incur that cost as an agent. Now all of this assumes, uh, as this example does, that we have an individual as a plaintiff. Of course, the emphasis uh, on some of this may change if the plaintiff was a corporation that was going to get an input credit in any event. Now the attendance of experts at trial, again the comments of above with respect to the non-medical expert reports would apply and it would appear that the attendance in court of the medical practitioner uh, would be a taxable supply because it's likely would be, even if that's on behalf of the individual client be pretty hard to uh, categorize that as part of the um, consultation diag uh, uh, diagnosis or, tr or treatment of, of a health care service now the structured settlement, again this, uh, the, that portion will be free of GST. And then the summary, the law firm will be required to collect GST from its client in regards to the following, legal fees, transcripts, photocopies, non-medical expert reports provided by a GST registrant and attendance of experts at the trial and the following disbursements will not be taxable provided they're incurred as agent for the client, the court filing fee, and the expert metal, medical reports. Now are there any comments or questions on that example? The only comment that I'd make is that I think you're quite right that uh, if it had been a corporate uh, client, the documentation requirements might have been quite different since they would get an input tax credit. and. That really feeds into Irene's uh, point that uh, the billing may well be customized to the client. If it's an individual, you may have to go through a, a fairly detailed process of trying to protect them from uh, incurring GST where the uh, exempt character or, or of the underlying uh, property or services can, can be maintained. If it's corporation, then the more administratively easy thing may be simply to bill all in, charge tax, and have them recover the tax through the input tax credit mechanism. The question is uh, that the discovery transcript is normally a cost incurred on behalf of the client and uh, is it possible for the firm uh, to both claim the credit on that cost uh, and also charge the cost back to the client? Is that yeah. Well, 
Am I going to get any help? No. Um, the, uh, it, it'll turn on how you happen to handle the billing, but if you engage the court reporter to come and attend it to the discovery and, and incur the fee in your, on your own right, then yes, you would be entitled to an input credit. If you do it as an agent on behalf of your client, then it would be a, just a straight pass-through or flow-through. You wouldn't claim an input credit. You've been reimbursed and uh, you were nothing more than an agent and the client, if an individual, would not be entitled to an input credit. It just, and maybe to make, put the same point another way, there, there is no double recovery. The, um, the cost of the transcripts is being passed through either as a, an agency disbursement uh, or it's being, pa it's being absorbed as an expense and, and being passed through as, as part of your total fee, but there's no double recovery. And so if you, if you go the agency route, you cannot claim the input tax credit. If you, if you rolled it into your fee, then you, you incur a cost, which is the tax, and then claim that tax back as an input tax credit. In that latter example, for example, $100 uh, charged by the court reporter or reporting service to which is added 7% GST, you're going to get an input credit, and you would show as a disbursement the 100, not the 7, and then you would add 7 to it as part of the GST, like you do the rest of your bill. So you wouldn't show it as 107, then add 7% again. Okay, shall, shall we okay. Move, on? move on to the next case study. Which is the first one. Which is the first one. Real estate transaction. Mr. and Mrs. Smith arrive in your office with a signed agreement for the purchase and sale of a new house from XYZ Builder Limited. The Smiths were told by one of your other clients that you would be able to assist them in obtaining a second mortgage. You explained to the Smiths that you would be happy to arrange a mortgage for a fee of $1,500 inclusive of any or all disbursements and that the fee for legal services will be approximately $2,000 plus disbursements. The Smiths give you a retainer of $1,000. You arrange for title to the property to be searched and send out the necessary requisitions. You find a potential mortgagee who requests a property valuation. Accordingly, you retain, you, accordingly, you retain an appraiser and based on his report, the mortgagee agrees to advance funds. The transaction closes and you register the necessary documents. You dictate a reporting letter and prepare your account. Now, in this example, we have um, GST analysis and then it's followed by sample invoices um, received by the law firm. ABC property appraisers, there's their bill with a GST. DEF conveyancing, uh, you retain someone outside to do the conveyancing work, title search, etc. And you'll see that uh, there was GST added. And then there's agency disbursements. Document registration, for example, without GST being added. Hand and foot barristers and solicitors account. You'll see in the final page the legal service rendered. Um, repurchase of 70 Black Acre, and there's the fee plus the GST. And then there's brokerage services and no GST. Now that's, and then there's one more page. Sorry, there's two more pages dealing with the disbursements, photocopies, conveyancing fees, etc., and the GST. Agency, title search fee, registration fee, etc., and total disbursements, and then the final page is the page is a summary. Now, having gone through that very quickly, let's go back to the analysis part as it relates. First of all, number point number one: the purchase of a new home by the Smiths will be subject to GST. Remember, used residential housing is not subject; resales are not subject to GST, but new are. This doesn't really concern us as lawyers, though. That's something the builder will charge the, um, the purchaser and um, there is a, a new home uh, rebate that reduces the, um, reduces the impact of the GST for purchases under certain, uh, certain dollar values. So we don't have to concern ourselves with that. Now, secondly, second point, no GST becomes payable on payment of the retainer. 
as the retainer is not treated as consideration for the supply until, it's supplied, until it, it is applied to the account. Facts really didn't um, say what, how we handled it, but we assumed that it was put into the trust account and then when and if the bill was rendered, uh, it, it showed uh, the retainer being applied and that's in fact, when you look at page three, what happened on the bill. You'll see the, the total was 3752.48, less amount in trust of $1,000, leaving a net amount to be billed. So that's our clue to the fact that it wasn't applied as a fee until the bill was actually rendered. Number three, the appraiser fee for the property valuation will be taxable and the law firm will be required to pay GST on it. The law firm, however, will not be entitled to claim an input tax credit in respect of the GST paid because the service for was used in providing brokerage services which are a tax exempt supply. Now, caveat again, I'm not, this is for the purposes of illustrating the rules, I don't think it's, um, I'm not offering an opinion that the brokerage part of it, the arranging of the mortgage is in fact tax exempt. It's an issue uh, that we'll have to deal with. Had the fee for brokerage services been exclusive of disbursements, it would have been possible for the law firm to incur the expense as agent of the client and seek reimbursement from the client for the appraisal fee and for the GST the law firm would have paid on behalf of the client. Now, the fourth point deals with the conveyancing, title searching, etc. If you send your own conveyancer to do the title search, there would be no GST consequences as salary and wages are not subject to GST. However, if you retain an outside uh, firm or business that's, that's, that provides that kind of service, unless they're a small supplier, it would be subject to GST. And either uh, where it is subject to GST, you're entitled to an input credit. So as long as you can pass your costs on to your client, um, you really don't care whether you've obtained that service in-house or, or from an outside firm. Now number five, the fee charged by the registry office for searching title is an exempt supply pursuant to paragraph 20E2 of part six of schedule five. Now, since this expense is tax exempt, whereas legal fees will be taxable, you should incur these expenses as an agent for the client and segregate them from the non-agency disbursements such as photocopy expenses. The next part I've already spoken to, uh, what happens if you use an outside conveyancer. Now point number six, the registration of documents in the registry office will not be subject to GST and the comments in five would apply vis-a-vis um, -vis the issue of agency and whether you have to pass GST on. And we flip over then to through the, um, the pages showing the accounts and we get to the summary. We'll see GST paid by law firm paid $14 on the appraisal and $4.20 to the conveyancer for a total of $18.20. Input credit not entitled for the appraiser because that related to the value of the property for arranging the mortgage. Whereas the conveyancer, and let me go back to that, that's again on the assumption that one concludes that that part of the practice is um, tax exempt. Now. You recall in the paper the correction um, regarding the reference to section 185. If the lawyer is not a financial institution, i.e. because he's below the 10% threshold, less than 10% of his total revenue are from funi exempt financial services such as arranging mortgages, then this input credit would in fact be eligible to be claimed. So. In my case study, the error not entitled, that not entitled only if the lawyer is a financial institution. So if the lawyer is not a financial institution, the lawyer is entitled to that input credit even though, even though the fee charged for that service was exempt. And just to refresh your memory, section 185 says that if what you're doing is related 
What you're doing in providing an exempt financial service is related to your taxable services, namely your services of providing advice, and that's an arguable point, incidentally, then the inputs that are for the financial service are considered to be for the, the taxable legal service. It's a rule that provides relief to any business that provides mainly taxable services almost exclusively, but happens to provide an exempt service in the process. It relieves you from the difficulty of allocating. Now, you'll see GST collected. On the legal fees was $140, on the photocopies was $1.40, and for the conveyancer was $4.20. And then it calculates the difference that the law firm would remit. Okay, are there any questions on that example? Okay, just a few comments then on the um, the uh, case studies. I think very well uh, illustrate the uh, a lot of the principles coming out of Irene's. Uh, paper on accounting systems and the need not only to identify the uh, substantive rules that apply to a law practice, but to adopt an accounting system that is sophisticated enough to, uh, to allow you to identify uh, your purchases and allow you to bill your clients uh, in, in a way that allows you to make enough money to, uh, to pay the rent. Because obviously you can spend a lot of time doing each one of these things as a one-off uh, transaction. Just generally on some of the points that Irene uh, made, uh, first that as a general rule, um, the GST on your purchases will, will not form part of your cost, but rather in your accounting system, you will have to, uh, you, what you should do is segregate it and show it as a separate item. That's the tax on your inputs, so that you will later be able to claim it as an input tax credit and easily identify it. Uh, Irene. Uh, uh, made a number of very helpful recommendations, including uh, the suggestion that documentation uh, in, in the documentation area on purchases, the general rule in industry is likely to be that people will insist on tax extra billing, and you will find that a lot easier in your practice if you do the same thing. And I think what you have to envisage is a billing clerk who is uh, receiving in invoices and having to identify the amount of tax that relates to those invoices. Uh, Irene mentioned that there are breaking points at the $30 level. Uh, under 30, 30 to 150, and 150 up. Uh, Tom didn't apply those to the invoices in the um, in the case studies, but if you, as a useful exercise, you can do that, and uh, you'll notice that uh, vendors registration numbers would have to be added, and certain line item information would have to be in those invoices to comply with the documentation um, requirements. Uh, in your systems, you'll have to identify your services. What in your in your services themselves? What is taxable at seven percent? What is zero rated? You'll have to have a, a method of tracking disbursements uh, that you incur as an agent and a method for, for applying the deposit rule because of the special timing on liability for tax on deposits. Uh, Irene uh, very usefully suggested the, uh, the idea of keeping a vendor master file, uh, which you would basically um, use to identify those suppliers to your firm uh, whom you had vetted. And if you had vetted their invoices previously and found them to be sufficient, then you could th thereafter accept their invoices as, uh, as received without requiring further, uh, further review uh, on the understanding that they would not change their billing practice without notice. Uh, there's the importance of, of account coding, which is splitting the GST from the invoice and um, making sure that the person who is dealing with the incoming invoices is picking up the right number. Uh, another useful suggestion, the, uh, the idea of having exception reporting built into your system so that if no input tax credit is claimed, you'll be able to pull down those invoices and have them reviewed on a periodical basis. And this is not unlike the idea of having your accountant go over your expenses at the end of the year to determine whether you've missed any deductions. But as I mentioned, if you miss an input tax credit, it's a 7% cost and it's an out-of-pocket cost. So you may well have received an invoice that was tax included and if, in fact, uh, by error, have identified it as a tax exempt or a zero rated or a non taxable fee or service, then you will have lost the tax that's in that invoice. So it's very, it's, I think, very important to, particularly with material amounts, to be able to identify where, where, where you're not claiming a credit and to go over that on a, certainly a, in, in, during the inception of the GST 
to be able to figure out whether, in fact, you've correctly identified the, uh, the, uh, the purchases. And for example, uh, Tom's example of, of the title searcher, if you're using a title searcher who is an employee, there's no tax payable by the law firm because you will pay that employee wages and salaries. If, on the other hand, um, you're using a freelancer who charges you a fee and is not a small trader, this is the under $30,000 category, then the fee will be taxable. Now what happens if your accounting department decides that all title searchers are uh, exempt as being uh, either wages and salaries or simply because they're title searchers? In that example, you, you could well be being billed by freelance title searchers and uh, ignoring the uh, input tax credit that's generated by, uh, by those bills. Uh, Irene reviewed the restrictions on the input tax credits and for those of you who missed tax reform, this is another opportunity to learn about the disallowance on meals and entertainment expenses and uh, the restrictions on capital cost allowance on passenger vehicles uh, and, and of course the general disallowance of the deductibility of club membership since these same concepts or principles get carried over into the goods and services tax but as Irene uh, described, with, with an added layer of, of complexity because of, the, uh, because of the provisions of the goods and services tax. Uh, one, one last point that I'd like to make, which comes out of Irene's comments about um, cash flow. First, the, again, the importance of, uh, of teaching uh, partners how to bill. And secondly, the possible capital requirements of the GST that if, in fact, you're unable to get your clients to pay within 30 days, there's a very strong chance that you're going to, you will be carrying an additional 7% on your accounts receivable. And uh, that will mean uh, arranging a, a greater line of credit or arranging a greater capital contribution to your firm. So that, that little cash flow, flow difference of uh, 30 to 45 days or 60 days or 90 days, whatever it takes to, uh, to render the accounts uh, or to render and collect the accounts is going to mean an additional 7% capital requirement on your accounts receivable. Uh, we've got a, a ton of questions here, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll sort them out in a moment and then and get started. I'll pick some easy ones. Pick some, Irene, Irene has some, so she'll, she'll start off. Thank you. You have my name on them. They're also the easiest ones. Um, <coughs> this question is, you say to invoice separately those services given as principal and agent. Can they be listed under separate headings on the same bill or do they have to be on a separate invoice. They can be on the same piece of paper. They just have to be identified separately on the invoice, an indication as to whether they're taxable or not. Should I go on with this? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question was, please review again the relationship between GST and PST. Well, all the provinces have not made formal statements, right now it's thought that seven of the uh, nine taxing provinces will apply their tax to the GST. So the invoice would be 100 plus $7 GST for a subtotal of 107 and then the provincial tax. BC and Manitoba have indicated that they will not tax the GST and their tax will apply to the 100. That could change once they sharpen their pencils because they currently tax federal sales tax and if they don't tax GST they will lose revenues. Um, commercial leases, the question is why if rent is payable Feb 1 um, and GST payable then can credit not be claimed until March 31st? Well essentially what happens is you're always on a rolling, uh, well first of all if your revenues are in excess of six million dollars a year you're a monthly filer. So what that means is you claim your credits and remit your tax by the end of the month following when the transactions occurred. So if rent is invoiced Feb 1, then you claim the credit at the end of March. Similarly, the landlord who is a monthly filer collects the tax from you Feb 1 and remits it to the government at the end of March. The timing of the credit and the payment are exactly the same. Okay, GST number, is it for sure a nine digit number? Well, that's a revenue set. So we have six months, but I think it is right now a nine digit number, is it not? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, it's a nine digit number. Registration kits, where do we get them? Uh, you should have received one if you are filing an income tax return. Two million were sent out at the end of May uh, to anyone who files self-employed or business uh, return. They um, are pre-registration kits. They cannot force anyone to comply or to complete the kit because it's not yet law. You just have to have a registration kit by Jan 1, 1991. So there's, that's the deadline, is Jan 1. If you don't register in advance, you won't get any information from them. So we're encouraging businesses to complete the form. If you did not receive a registration kit, you soon will be able to get one at the post office. Right now, they want people to send in the computer-coded ones, so they're not releasing them to the post offices for another couple of weeks. Oh, Irene, just to... Or have they released them? No, no, it wasn't that. Oh. I was just that if you, if you receive the registration form and are, and are not required to register, you may want to make a comment about that. Yeah, if you received a registration form and you're not required to re-register, complete it and send it in because the second wave of reminders are, are coming out, and I know I received mine, and... Lake we're, 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 says he hasn't received his yet, but uh, send your forms in. So that's every partner in an accounting form because they will continue to contact you. Hotline for the government. GST hotline. I don't know the number because... Yeah, there is an 800 number, uh, yeah. which is a toll-free number. It might and be on the back of your uh, kit here. Uh, in, in the pamphlet. Okay, the hotline for the uh, GST hotline is province of Ontario. Okay, for Toronto, the number is 973-1000. That's Toronto, that's a direct line. Or the, if you're outside the Toronto area, it's 1-800-461-1082. And if you want to talk to somebody in Ottawa, uh, direct line is 990-8584. And the toll-free number is 1-800-465-6160. One comment I might add to that is that uh, if you have access to CT Online, there is a database of questions and answers from Revenue Canada on GST. And uh, if you have access to CT Online, I believe there's no, no charge for the, um, for, for the access to the database, although I think, I think line charges apply. Yeah, line charges. Uh, the advantage of using that system is that you can search through and see if your question has already been answered or if you want to get a little background in the area before you uh, use the hotline, you can do that. Just answer, can I answer these two quickly? Just the, I'll just answer these last two. Remitting GST, where to and what info needed, uh, you'll find that out once you register. They will send you returns and uh, in pre-addressed envelopes, you'll just send it in. Very limited information on the return, total sales, GST collected, total purchases, GST uh, paid, adjustments, net. It's all subject to audit afterwards. Agent principal it said, why bill separately for certain charges? The only time you want to bill separately is to retain tax exempt status when your client is not eligible for a full credit. If your client gets a full credit, there is no reason to invoice it separately. Just lump it all together, add on the tax, and collect it. If your client's a consumer, or a bank, or a mush, one of those people, they're going to want everything split out so they don't get overcharged GST. Thank you. Tom, take, take a few questions. Sure. A couple um, logistical type questions. First of all, the question is when will correcting pages for t today's lectures be issued? I'm not sure precisely when, but I'm advised by Brenda Duncan that co correcting pages will go out very shortly for the participants. Secondly, uh, someone points out, and I'm glad I gave you my caveat that I don't do uh, real estate transactions myself in my own practice. Apparently, according to this note, independent conveyancers' fees cannot be charged as a disbursement pursuant to law society rules. That's news to me, and I appreciate that being pointed out. Um, Excuse me. Uh, there's a point back here. Uh, uh, 
There we go. We have a more up-to-date report. We, read we have that a into, into the record, Tom. Read into the record that Rule 9 was amended in uh, what, what month? March of 1989. And so lawyers are now allowed to charge as a disbursement independent conveyancers fees. So we're now all educated on this particular point. Now, questions. And first one is a good one. A U.S. resident individual comes to your office in Toronto to discuss a Canadian business venture. You give some preliminary advice. The client returns to the U.S. and you do additional research and you prepare a memo. Is this zero rated uh, within section 7 that I was referring to in my paper? Now, there's an issue in there about I uh, mentioned individuals being outside Canada during throughout the period or throughout the time the service is performed and that question is obviously designed for that. We can duck the question because we can look further down in section 9 says a supply made to a non-resident person of an advisory consulting or research service that is intended to assist the person in taking up residence or establishing a business venture in Canada. So regardless of where the individual is, we, we happen to have an out for that particular question in another section, section 9. However, the question is a good one. Um, and strictly speaking, the exemption seems to require that the individual be outside Canada throughout the time the service is performed. So uh, in the absence of some help from um, Blake or Irene, I think the visit to Toronto could jeopardize the uh, zero rating status, although if it was just to come to Toronto to give instructions and all the service is performed after the person leaves, there, hopefully there will be sufficient latitude administratively so as to allow the, the lawyer or accountants or whoever, whatever professional is, is in this situation. Is there any comment from Blake or Irene on that? No talk. Thank you. I see. You're going to let me sink or swim myself. Um, the second question is, you give advice to a U.S. corporation. These are, it, these are good questions because it shows people are thinking. You give advice to a U.S. corporation regarding the tariff classification of various goods to be reported or imported into Canada. Does the exclusion in 7C of Part 5 of the schedule apply and you recall that I mentioned that when you're providing services to non-residents if you fall within any of A to E you're outside that zero rating and uh, C was a service in respect of tangible personal property that is ordinarily situated in Canada or that is to be delivered in Canada well the question really doesn't state where the goods were delivered like whether they are FOB the plant in the US or wherever they came from or whether they were going to be cleared through customs and then delivered. In any event, it does elicit an issue there. Um, I, I gave the example of a, giving advice on the contract that was going to be entered into that may have resulted in that shipment. Again, applying this rule very technically, a service in respect of, those words are very wide in their meaning, um, in respect of goods to be delivered, it relates to the um, tariff classification which is relevant on the shipment and um, absent some other rule that would specifically apply that may very well disqualify uh, the, um, the legal service from being zero rated and that would apply whether it's a customs broker or a lawyer giving that advice. Any help from the panel? Does it strike you any differently or? Sounds good. Okay, we're going to go with that answer. Um, the next question uh, relates to executor's fees. Are they subject to GST? And I believe the answer is yes, they are. Again, unless the person providing those services is a small supplier and under the $30,000 threshold. I think they would be similarly treated as to the trustee's fees that I refer to in the paper. Uh, next question is another interesting one. For insurance companies as clients in defense related matters, are our services 100% taxable to them without an input tax credit such that interim bills for services to December 31, 1990 should be rendered? Um, <clears throat> just so those of you who don't know, 
insurance is exempt under the GST legislation. That means insurance companies are not entitled to input credits for costs that they incur. Those costs would incur the f lawyer's fees. So the answer is yes, uh, to the extent you've got work in progress at the end of the year, you should bill them prior to May the 1st, 1991 for those services to ensure that you don't have to add a GST, which they can't get an input credit for. Now, having said that, the insurance companies are reviewing their position under the GST, and they've looked to some other jurisdictions, including the United Kingdom. And um, what we've learned is that in the United Kingdom, after many years of discussions with the revenue authorities, the law society there, and the insurance companies, they've worked out an administrative arrangement whereby lawyers' fees, as well as costs incurred on claims, like an automobile claim, automobile's been written off, the automobile's replaced. Um, if it's a commercial client, they would get input credits if they incurred the cost themselves and then got reimbursed by the insurance company net of GST because they'll get an input credit. Same would be true for the legal services. And an arrangement has been worked out in the UK. It's partly legal, but a big part of it's administrative. Um, discussions, I'm sure, will occur in Canada. So that, at the moment, the answer is no. If the insurance company incurs the legal fee, it is taxable. Work is underway by the insurance industry, though, to see if they can come to some uh, understanding of the current of the proposed law to avoid that result. And there are some difficulties on legal fees, uh, which more so than there are, say, for the actual out-of-pocket costs, which are reimbursed. And it comes down to certain of our own rules as to who your client is and who you bill. And um, but at the moment, it's a good excuse to get your bills out before May the first. 1991. Okay, one more. Um, I don't like the one more. <laughs> I'll read it anyway. Are disbursements paid out of trust on real estate transactions taxable? That's the first question. The second one, when disbursements for travel expenses are paid in advance by the client, would this be considered a retainer and as such taxable? Disbursements paid out of trust on real estate transactions taxable. It depends on the nature of the, of the charge. Like if the disbursements for land transfer tax, there's no GST at that point. Since the funds are in trust, I presume there's no GST up front, and it's only when it gets applied. And if it gets applied to a taxable disbursement, um, like an out-of-office conveyancer, then it would be... Um, GST would then be applied at that point. If it's a tax exempt, like a land transfer tax or a registration fee, um, then, then there would be no GST. Now, when you rebuild to the client, of course, and account for what you've taken out of your trust, if you haven't done so as agent, then any of those that were exempt would become taxable. Now, the second part of this question was, when disbursements for travel expenses are paid in advance by the client, would this be considered a retainer and as such taxable? Again, I think it depends on what, what the lawyer does with the, the funds. If they put them in the trust account and hold them to be applied, then it would be treated as a retainer. Um, if it's treated as an advance fee for services to be rendered, then and not you know, held aside to be applied at a later point, then GST implications would arise at that time. So it d really depends on how it's treated w when you get the advance. Irene, would you like to answer some more questions, sure. please? Tom already answered a couple, but here is... Um, Which one's okay, how should PST be handled on the client ledger and invoice if the item purchased is subject to both GST and PST? Well, essentially, the PST flows with the purchased good or service. It's only the GST that you extract posted to a GST receivable account. But whatever the item costs, it's including the PST, because you don't get that back until such time as the provinces implement a GST <laughs> or join the feds and have a national sales tax. For the time being, PST will continue to form part of your goods cost. 
Um, these are already answered. There's one here. Okay, a phone bill. Will GST be calculated on total or total plus provincial tax? Again, as I mentioned before, same rules for phone bills. It will vary by province. With the exceptions of BC and Manitoba, the PST will apply after the GST cumulatively, and BC and Manitoba, they'll both be applied to the same subtotal. Um, Okay, these have all been pretty well answered. I guess on legal aid fees, one question was, as legal aid fees are not subject to the GST, do we not charge them tax? I think as Blake mentioned, you will charge everyone the tax, and then it's up to the client to figure out their own tax status. That's supposed to be one of the beauties of this system. You don't have to know what they do. They just figure it out themselves. The one exception may be the provincial government who uh, may, it's likely that the reciprocal taxation agreement between the feds and the provinces will expire at the end of the year and uh, the provinces will not pay GST. But that, the details still have to be worked out. Okay, I'll re-answer the next one. If staff payroll is paid by a management company and my office is billed that amount plus 15% markup, do I get charged the GST and then obtain input credits? Um, or is the entire employee service uh, exempt? Definitely the um, management company will charge GST and you will claim the credit. So it's a wash. If you were a doctor, on the other hand, it's not a wash. And uh, the attractiveness of management companies is quickly dwindling for doctors and dentists because now what will happen is the management company would charge GST to the doctor, the doctor's exempt, doesn't get taxed back, so just gave the government extra money because of having that set up. But for law firms it doesn't matter, it's a, just a flow through. You figured out the answer yet? <laughs> okay. Going. All right, keep going. I don't have any more. Well, let's get into this one. We may not have all the answers. Um, what is the effect of GST on, and there's two things listed here. The first is damage awards in civil actions, and the second is costs awards in civil actions. Now, going back to the first question, the, the award itself will not be set to GST. Now, the question is a little broader than that. What is the effect? of GST on damage awards. Well, given that GST is going to be added to everything after the end of this year, then maybe the costs, costs will go up, but the damage award itself will not be set to GST. The only point being is that part of the measure of damages may go up, and part of the costs of doing all this may go up. Now, B, costs, costs awards in civil, civil actions. I think the consensus is, um, that the, the awards themselves will not be subject to GST. I guess the question is whether, whether the awards will take into account GST. And that, um, I think, will turn on what, the, what happens with the, uh, the tariff, uh, for, for example, when the costs are restricted to the tariff. So presumably the tariff should be adjusted to take into account the impact of, uh, of GST. There may be more to it than that, and um, but that's all that, that occurs to us at the moment. Do you have more? There's more questions here. No, I don't think there's more. Here's another question. With respect to the transitional rules, 1990 legal services are exempt, provided they are billed prior to May 1, 1991. There seems to be some opinion that the services must also be paid by that date. The answer is no, they need not be paid by that date. As long as they are due um, by, prior to May 1st, and they are due as soon as an invoice is issued, um, and Section 152 of the legislation makes that fairly clear. So even if you're not paid by that date, as if it was billed by that date. Now, you might not want to point that out to your client. You may just say, look, we better bill this prior to May the 1st in order to ensure that it's free of GST and let your client draw his own conclusion as to when he might want to pay it. 
Uh, in other words, don't invite them not to pay it for another year or two. Okay. Um, just another question on legal aid. Essentially, because you will be charging legal aid, because you'll be charging GST on legal aid, it does not limit your input tax credits. So even though the legal aid subsequently gets a rebate, you will still get all your input tax credits. I have a question here, which I'm going to uh, read out. It's a <laughs> draft tax avoidance scheme. Uh, on a client account, an invoice is sent to the corporate office in the USA for work done for an Ontario division. The payment is made uh, in different Payment is made through, in different circumstances, through one, payment through the U.S. head office, or two, payment through the Ontario division office. Again, this is not an opinion. Um, this is, it is possible that this would work, but it, has, it is fraught with risk. The, um, the, the main concern is that the legal services are going to be for use or in consumption in effect in, in Canada, so that if you apply a number of these tests and you, you look at what they're going to be, you'd have to look at what the underlying work was. But if it, for example, if it related to, to real estate uh, located in Canada, it would convert it into a very easy question. But if it had to do with the debt financing by the Ontario company, it would be a more difficult question, but you might still get to the same, the same place. The, the, main, the main thing is that, is, that, is that it's probably taxable. And the big risk here is that if you don't tax it, um, yet you are going to run the risk of later on having a secondary liability in a situation in which the Ontario company probably could have got a full input tax credit. And just, just to take it apart, if, if the billing is made to the U.S. company, the U.S. company will, will probably not be a registered person. So if you, if you apply no tax, revenue may later come to the law firm that did the billing and, uh, and look for the 7% tax on their fees on the basis that this was a scam. And as uh, Tom mentioned, there is a general anti-avoidance rule in the, um, in the Excise Tax Act. Secondly, um, because it's a non-registered person, uh, if tax were exigible, it couldn't get an input tax credit. So you wouldn't be able to wash it out through the U.S. company on a, on a retroactive um, basis. On the other hand, if you had charged the tax to the Ontario company, it would have gotten the tax back through the input tax credit system unless it was a, a company engaged in making exempt supplies such as a financial institution or a you know, medical practice or daycare service or one of the other exempt supplies. So uh, whoever wrote this question uh, clearly is thinking, but uh, I, I think, uh, I think it, has, it has risks in it. And if, in fact, it's a taxable transaction, it, the risk may not be warranted by the cash flow benefit of avoiding uh, the uh, collection of the tax uh, and, and subsequent reclaiming of the input tax credit. Oh, Tom, do you have one more question? There? Well, if I understand the question properly, it may have already been answered, um, but I'll read it. It was suggested that WIP prior to January 1, 1991 be billed to save additional clients, individual clients GST. In personal injury actions, if you do this where you don't anticipate settlement and or in payment one to two years down the road, and then reserve the fee for a January 31 year end, will that fee then be set to GST when ultimately collected and brought back into revenues? I think the answer is no. I mean, if you render an invoice and the amount is due under the invoice on a date that is, for example, January 31, 91, under the rules, that would not be set to GST when paid because the GST rules consider the date of the issuing of the invoice as the relevant date for determining whether you're grandfathered or not, not the due date on the invoice. And under a mature GST system, that'll be the same as well. You issue an invoice today, assuming we're into GST, payment specified in six months, you must finance the GST in the interim, and uh, the, uh, the client gets an input credit. It also says, will other matters reserved be reduced effectively by 7107th if subsequently recovered after May 1, 1991? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but the likelihood is, is yes. 
Again, though, if it's for services performed uh, or goods delivered prior to 1991, which are billed by May 1st, then they are grandfathered uh, and not set to GST. Any other? Yes, I have one last uh, question, if there are no others. It's a proofreading question. And the, the questioner asks, wh where is the closed parenthesis uh, at page 6 of Tom's uh, paper? And uh, paragraph A, uh, page 6 of Tom's paper, at, at it, it sets out the uh, uh, ex excluded services from zero-rated exports, and um, after service. After service. Yes. and the the bracket ends in, in this is page six, line two. The bracket ends after professional service, and essentially the effect is that uh, if the service is an advisory, consulting, or professional service. Uh, it is not excluded from being zero rated if it's, even if it's primarily for the consumption, use, or enjoyment in Canada of, uh, of any person, which in fact may qualify my previous answer because the, the effect of this rule is that uh, law firms don't have to vet where their services are to be consumed, used, or enjoyed. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor uh, arising out of the answers that were given or any questions that haven't been picked up? There's a question down there. I'm not sure I, I, I heard the entire question. Did, did I, I, yes, I think I understand the question. You're saying, is, is it true that uh, you, you can effectively do a, say 10% of the work or 10% of the time can be after uh, January 1st of 1991 and have the services retain their excluded status or grandfather status under the uh, transitional rule. And I believe that's correct, but the wording is that the service has to be substantially performed by December 31st of 1990. And the Department of Finance and Revenue Canada interprets substantially performed as meaning as meaning 90%. Now, it could mean 89%, but uh, they interpret it as meaning 90%. Oh. Yes, The question, you're asking whether a line item is a duplication? It could the reference to disbursements? Okay. Tom, I, I believe the question is there's a double reference to disbursements at the bottom of the invoice on page 3. And the question is whether the second reference is uh, is a duplication. Mm -hmm. Irene, you're the accountant. Yes. Do you have any insight? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believe he has put these numbers in twice because we have total disbursements yeah. 129, then total, then less amount of trust, trust. Then we've got total disbursements total and less amount of trust. I don't think. Pardon? Yeah, I don't think these last numbers should be on here. Yeah. So the consensus appears to be that the last four lines of uh, on page three of the invoice in the real estate materials is is a uh, is an error and should be deleted from that page. Thank you very much. Are there any are there any other questions? Well, uh, the only point is um, apologize for that, but it does appear to be a reprint um, of what immediately preceded it, and that'll be picked up on the erratum sheets that'll be coming out shortly. Okay. 
Are there any other questions before we adjourn? One, one here. Yes. Okay, uh, I think I understand the question. I think the, the, the question is that, that there is an apparent inconsistency in the Act in that uh, for the purposes of determining whether a supply is made in Canada, and I, I'll just accept it for the sake of discussion, that, it, that, that the registration or, or the Act performing legal services in connection with the registration of a intellectual property right such as a trademark registration or a patent would not be a supply made in Canada. And yet, uh, the, um, in the definition of zero-rated supplies under exports in services, uh, it uh, carves out all agency services. And you're asking us to comment on that apparent inconsistency? I believe the, the analysis is that to be taxable under the basic part of the, uh, the goods and services tax, this is to say the supplies made in Canada, you fr first must conclude that under those rules in section 143 and following, the supply is made in Canada. If it's made outside Canada, it falls outside of that division and then will be taxed only if it falls into the imported supplies provision, which is, comes later on. So the, 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 the logic is it must first be a supply made in Canada. If it's a supply made in Canada, you then look to see whether it's a zero rated supply. Okay, if it's, if it's a supply made outside Canada, so is it a supply made in Canada? If it's a supply made outside Canada, it falls outside the scope of the Act. You still get an input tax credit, but it does, it's not taxable under uh, the supplies made inside Canada. If it's uh, supplies made outside Canada. If it's a supply made inside Canada, you must then read the schedules to determine whether or not it's an exempt supply or a zero rated supply. So I, I believe in your, to follow your analysis that if the supply is made outside Canada, uh, for, for the purposes of uh, 143, it isn't taxable unless uh, it can be taxed as an imported supply if the, um, an imported supply is a very funny term, but it's a, it's a defined term and it refers to uh, property or services made outside Canada uh, for a Canadian person. So effectively what they've done is analogize the importation of the supply of services to the importation of goods. But if, you, if, a, if a financial institution, for example, has an architect draw plans for them uh, and they, the architect does it in New York, that's an imported supply. And even though the supply is made outside Canada, tax will be triggered on that supply to a financial institution on a self-assessment basis. And the only point I'm making is that in a very convoluted fact situation, you could have a situation where a supply is not made in Canada, it's made outside Canada, but it's made outside Canada for a financial institution. The financial institution is under an obligation to self-assess itself on those transactions. But the general rule, if you're, if you're in a commercial activity, and i.e. not a financial institution, not, not a supplier of exempt supplies, is that there is no self-assessment so that once you conclude that the supply is made outside Canada, that's, that's it, the, the, uh, the item falls outside the tax. Uh, are there any comments, Irene? Do you I have? was going to say <coughs> that when they say that a supply of um, intangible property is made outside of Canada, it's very limited. It's much more limited than the exported one. They say it's only made outside of Canada if the property may not be used in Canada. But then when you go to the exports, they zero rate all supplies of intangible property to um, a non-resident, non-registered person. So it's much more generous than the beginning. Oh, when you go up, because there's, okay, because there's a specific exported 
um, intangible. But it's zero rated under a supply of a patent, trademark, trade. But you're saying about your fee relating to that. Yes, it's the fee that's the. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, are there any other questions uh, coming from the audience? There's one, one there. Uh, the question is, uh, will there be administrative problems uh, where you've got a cost-sharing arrangement where a number of lawyers practice law under a, under a firm name but in fact are not partners as between themselves but uh, agree to share expenses? Uh, would Revenue Canada permit them to file one? Okay. It's On what basis do they bill the uh, the partnership? Do they? I don't think. I was going to say I don't view that as being any different than the. I'm trying to think of fixed interest uh, partner. Yeah, or or no, but I'm thinking like an independent sales contractor. I mean, lots of times an Avon representative. Everyone thinks they're an individual of Avon. They're an independent sales contractor. They have to be registered, collect separately, file their own returns. And I think that lawyer, it's not a member of the partnership, and it would have to file his own returns. It, just, it, it depends. Could just, can we just wow. try and get the question down? Uh, we'll try and get the question right anyway, and then we'll have the answer. But as I understand the question now, uh, you're, you're postulating a situation where you've got an existing law firm of, say, 20 lawyers, and an individual associates with that law firm. And, and 